So uh, at first, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Tanji and Sarah also and the Fields Institute for organizing this. I know this has been a, a double organization first physically and then virtually. So yeah, thanks a lot for that. Um, yeah, I'd be talking about near optimality robustness, which is an extension in a general forum for uh, bi-level optimization. So strengthening the formulation of bi-level problems. Uh, don't be too scared by the slide number. We'll cut short uh, after the, let's say, first three or four parts. So I'll be talking. I'll be giving a small refresh on uh, bi-level optimization itself, and then a motivation for for the problem. Why do we care about near optimality robustness? Why would we make bi-level problems harder? And then we'll focus on a formulation and solution approach for the convex and linear cases. All right. So, uh, bi-level optimization. We, I mostly consider it as embedding optimization problems in other optimization problems, uh, if you take a very generic um, formulation for it. Uh, for, from a, a gaming perspective, you can see it as um, um, sequential games, meaning that somebody is going to take a decision. So, in our case, this would be a, a so-called leader in the game taking a decision X, and then a follower will react by taking a decision V in, a follow, in the follower problem. So meaning that the follower will observe X decision and react to it optimally for them. And so this means that the leader will, in their decision, anticipate what the follower will decide on afterwards. So you have uh, lots of applications. Uh, we had some some examples yesterday that uh, use bi-level optimization a lot. So uh, pricing, revenue management, uh, energy markets, or markets in general even. Uh, you also have some application in engineering, but since this is mostly a game theory workshop, we'll focus on the game part. Right, so uh, if we take out all the complexity and try to get the, the simplest possible bi-level problem. So let's say a linear, linear bi-level problem. So the objective functions and uh, constraints are all linear. Uh, even in that case, uh, you end up with a NP-hard problem. So meaning that, yeah, so this, this form of problem here is already NP-hard. And you have a, a nice uh, transformation from bi-level problem to zero one uh, pure integer uh, games or pure integer optimization problems. Right, so uh, if we have, uh, so just to grasp why it's hard from a, let's say, geometric perspective, um, imagine you have this game here with just two variables. So the leader is controlling the x-axis and the follower is controlling the y-axis. And you're trying to optimize as a leader in the green direction here, and the follower is trying to minimize here. So let's say for a minute you ignore follower optimality. So you just consider you have this optimization problem. So you have to be inside this polytope and optimize in the green direction. You end up with uh, this solution here, this extreme vertex. But if you now consider that the follower will react and optimize their own problem, here their own problem will be to minimize in, uh, in the Y going down direction. So it means that if you go to this naive point, the follower will react by going to y equals zero and you end up with the objective here, which is not the optimum. So for any possible x here, uh, the follower will react by going as low as possible, which will be on their constraints here, which are the solid lines. And you end up with a real optim a global optimum, which is at this red point here, because if you always consider that the follower will react by going down as much as possible, um, the best possible point is this one. And if you think about it, your real feasible set is not this polytope here, which is convex. It's the, in, uh, the union of these three segments here, because the follower will always react by falling down on these. And this, this set here, roughly speaking, is, is non-convex. You can even make it disjoint by cutting it with other upper level constraints. So this is just to grasp an example, to grasp some intuition on why this problem is, is non-convex and hard to solve in general. Right, another difficulty or another particularity with bi-level problems is that they can be ill-defined. Um, usually when you have an optimization problem and you have multiple possible optimal solutions, uh, that's not much of a big deal. You just find any optimal solution. So any solution that breaches the, the optimal value. 
in the case of viable problems, that can be an issue because uh, your follower can also reach any possible optimal value. So this means if we take back this form here, you have to anticipate for V being an optimal, an optimal solution, but we don't, you don't know which one will be taken because there might be several ones. Uh, the two standard approaches in the bi-level literature for this kind of problem is um, the first one being, yeah, first one being the optimistic assumption, meaning that uh, you assume that the follower will take an optimal decision for them, obviously, but in these optimal decision for them, they will take the one that is the best for the follower, for the leader. And the pessimistic assumption is the other way around. So meaning you assume that the follower might take any possible decision, including the worst possible decision for you as a leader. Right, so uh, that, was, that was it for bi-level optimization in itself. Now, uh, what do we want? So in, in normal days, so outside of pandemic and so on, so I'm doing a PhD uh, jointly between uh, Northern France and Montreal. And for this, I, I, was, I was often traveling between uh, well, Paris, let's say, and, and Montreal itself. Uh, for that, I would usually try to pick the cheapest possible flight or yeah, optimize my cost in general. So if you imagine the, uh, like, let's say, Air Transat or any uh, company doing, um, well, pricing their, their tickets as a leader and me being a follower trying to pick the, the cheapest choice or even the flock of followers picking a, an optimal choice. Uh, my, so my optimal choices in that case will be these three days with 180, 89 euros. Uh, but one question, one open question you could ask is for three euros, maybe this Monday here should be included. Oh gosh, yeah, that was already one year, one year ago. I didn't realize time flies. Um, so yeah, maybe this Monday could also be included in the possible optimal set because it's just a three euro difference. And uh, this is the, the crux of uh, this near optimality uh, saying, would the follower really care about a very small deviation on their objective? So maybe I'm, I'm watching the price enough not to take this first day here because it's quite more expensive. It's already more expensive than the other solutions. But this free euro deviation on the Monday might be acceptable for me as a follower. Right, so, and that, that brings us to near optimality robustness. So the concept of near optimality is basically as a follower, I might deviate from my optimal solution. Now near optimality is basically saying as a leader of the game, instead of anticipating my follower to fully optimize their problem, I might anticipate them to optimize their problem up to a certain point. Meaning they will, they will optimize the problem but they might deviate a bit from this uh, rational behavior and take a solution that's just good enough. Um, and this has been uh, roughly introduced by, well, this has been introduced by uh, Wiesmann and others in 2013 in uh, pessimistic bi-level optimization, where they, they, so they named it uh, epsilon approximation. So this, this kind of uh, model where the lower level might deviate by this epsilon. Um, but they, so they don't, carry on that much on this model, they just construct it for, for proof. What we do here is say this model is interesting in itself from a game perspective, let's say, and uh, we want to see if we can formulate, uh, well, if we can get a general formulation for this problem that's uh, tractable for some uh, structures of lower level problem. Right, so um, if you're in economics or in some branches of game theory, you might have heard of, of such concept. It's, it might be familiar. It's uh, often referred to as bounded rationality or epsilon rationality or quasi-rationality of a player. If a player, instead of being rational and taking the best possible decision, might take any solution that is good enough. And here, so we'll just name, instead of good enough, we'll say near optimal solution. And we will know this tolerance on the objective of the follower delta. So this would be how much they, how much they're okay to deviate from from their object from their optimal value. Um, so yeah, and so that's that's on the follower side. And what about the leader? So on the leader side, if you consider your follower or your lower level might deviate by this uh, by this delta, 
the, the objective for you in that case would be to be to remain feasible so to keep your constraint uh, val valid for any possible value of this in this near optimal set or of this near optimal follower behavior so uh, one way to interpret it uh, is your follower not being rational or possibly your follower having hidden objective functions like let's say secondary objectives or also your follower having some sort of lazy laziness behavior meaning they just they, instead of fully optimizing their objective they might pick something that's good enough with good enough being not too far from let's say the objective uh, the optimal value right um so if we now go so we have the concept roughly defined uh we'll now go to the formulation so get back to the math side of things uh, so just for the notation we'll note x as the upper level decision v will be the optimal optimistic lower level decision and z will be a possible near optimal uh, lower level decision and my capital z of x and delta here will be the near optimal set meaning the set of lower level, lower level de uh, decisions that are both feasible and near optimal so this means that the objective on z uh, the the objective cannot be worse than the rational objective of x of uh, x and v plus this delta this tolerance right so um we'll now go to the to a convex case so if we we take the formulation of our objective of our um, variable problem so we have uh, we're trying to minimize a function for the upper level and there are some constraints over x and v and v solves the lower level problem and we add this constraint which is the same as the upper level constraint here uh, it's exactly a copy so we copy it for any of the indices k of the upper level constraint except here instead of being uh, feasible of this constraint being active for only one solution v it has to be active for any z <clears throat> sorry for any z in the near optimal set so we have a constraint that has to be valid for yeah any z in this z of x delta here right uh, so instead of a very generic uh, convex problem we'll focus on uh, on convex conic cases so convex conic formulation of uh, convex problems uh, this is general enough that we can capture lots of uh, convex problems of practical interest and also the um, the dual formulation of a conic problem is has a nice structure that we can work with right so um so this means nothing changes compared to the slide before except now we just linearize everything and the lower level problem is a linear problem except that y has to belong to a uh, proper cone k here and uh, the lower level set doesn't change right so uh, that's it for this slide one particularity here if we get the terminology right for this uh, so this constraint here is a semi-infinite constraint because you have this constraint which has to be, this linear constraint has to be valid for a set of z that's possibly infinite uh, that is usually infinite in fact and it's generalized semi-infinite uh, it's a generalized semi-infinite constraint because z so the uncertain set itself depends on the decisions so it means our uncertain set will vary with the upper level decision x so th yeah this is a generalized some infinite constraint or a robust constraint with decision dependent uncertainty depending on the uh, kind of topic you study right so uh, we've seen a formulation for this problem it seems uh, fairly hard in general so we'll try to get um, a, a solution approach for this so we have this generalized some infinite constraint here and uh, this constraint being valid for any z is equivalent to being valid for the worst possible z so being valid to the maximum possible value of hkz such that uh, z belongs to the near optimal set and the near optimal set is described here with uh, this constraint this constraint so this uh, sub problem here is trying to find the worst possible case for our for our constraint um, 
if you're in the robust optimization literature, you've often heard of it possibly as uh, nature trying to hurt us or nature trying to play against us in, in problems. So that's a metaphor that's often taken. Uh, in our case, we will name this the adversarial problem. So the problem trying to get your constraints as infeasible as possible. And uh, the nice thing about this problem, if you observe it, so the feasible set is roughly the same as the lower level set that we had before uh, with this near optimal constraint here. And this means that uh, this adversarial problem is a convex conic, uh, is convex and conic, just like we had for the lower level problem. So assuming strong duality holds, and we, you know, so we'll assume this, this holds in that case. Uh, the worst case is equivalent to, to the dual. So meaning this quantity here, the maximum of, uh, of this quantity here is strictly equivalent to its dual. And so this equation still holds. Uh, so we just dualized the, the adversarial problem here, taking dual alpha and, and beta. And so we end up with a quantity being greater than the minimum of an optimization problem here. But a quantity being greater than the minimum, so uh, you've often seen that, seen that if you are in robust optimization again, is equivalent to just any dual variables existing, so being feasible here, and, being, and with this equation being valid. Because if you have the dual of the soil problem having a valid solution, and it respects your constraint, it means the minimum can only go below that and will also respect uh, the, the constraint. So if it means if you find any possible solution that is valid here, um, this the minimum, if it's lower, will also be valid. Right, so this means the only goal of the game here will be to find a, some, some dual variables, alpha, beta, and s, which are feasible and that respect this constraint. And this, these will certify, if we can compute them, that our problem is feasible and near optimal and robust to near optimal deviations, because it also means that the the primal adversarial problem cannot hurt us more than than we've anticipated for. Right. So um, yeah, again, if we have this uh, quantity being greater than a minimum, it's equivalent to just plugging back the sub the dual adversarial problem into our constraints. So we have just the initial constraints here being plugged back without the minimum. And uh, these uh, additional constraints there, which are here linear. In that case, these ones are just linear constraint or conic. And uh, and this one is the, the more complex one, which includes some bilinear terms, but that's it. Right, so we've dealt with a near optimal component of the problem. Um, we haven't dealt with uh, the bilevel problem itself. So how do we tackle bilevel problems in general? Well, we know that the, um, the, the lower level problem is a conic convex case, a uh, conic convex problem. And so we, if we have some, some additional assumptions, like it has a, an interior, a strict interior, then um, we can use the KKT conditions to, to fully describe optimality of this problem. So this means instead of having V solving a subproblem, we can replace it by V and its dual um, solving the, well, respecting the KKT conditions, which we plug back into the constraints. So this is fairly standard in, in bi-level optimization. So, and we've seen it yesterday, even in, well, in simultaneous games, plugging the, the, um, the, the optimality conditions directly in the constraint of the problems to, to compute a solution. So uh, if we go back to having our full optimal, well, if we plug everything together, let's say, um, so we have our initial problem here uh, with the blue constraints, which haven't changed. In orange, we have uh, V and lambda describing the lower level optimality. So V being the primal and lambda, uh, the corresponding duals, describing uh, lower level optimality. And near optimality robustness added the red constraints here, which is finding some dual certificates that respect the upper level constraints in any case. And so with that, uh, it means that we have, a, well, so we have a complete closed form problem with only 
linear conic constraints and uh, the only uh, let's say harder ones are C here so this uh, complementarity slackness condition and uh, these ones the red one here being uh, uh, bilinear non-convex constraints uh, the, the harder one is definitely the complementarity sl slackness and for these constraints what's usually done is um, relaxing relaxing this uh, complementarity slackness into uh, inequalities uh, to respect uh, constraint qualifications so this means here uh, if you know the, the two quantities are positive you just add an inequality to an epsilon which should drop to zero and the hope is to compute a local feasible uh, a local solution and in some cases it would be a local opti optimum so there's been some work here uh, i did a few pointers to work you know, to some some research uh, using this path of uh, replacing complementarity with relaxed uh, formulations which are then driven to a local point and so recently so in 2019 then we proved that if you use this scheme for bi level problems, you compute a local optimum solution, not just a stationary point. Right, so it means, so the, the good news, let's say, is that this constraint was the hardest one and was there from the, from the beginning. So, because solving bi level problems is hard anyways. And therefore, so the, the constraint that we added here are not adding much difficulty, let's say, to the problem because we, we had to have some non-convex uh, non bilinear terms here anyways. And what we're adding to the problem is constraints of, of the same nature or easier to solve. So the, let's say the good thing is that we didn't add anything that made the problem much harder compared to what it was initially. Right, uh, so in the last part, I'll go from, um, so from the convex case, which we solve, or more or less solve, to the linear case, can we push it a bit further in the linear case? So the same thing, except, so it's roughly the same thing, except the lower level problem now is a linear, a complete linear problem. So instead of Y being in a cone, you have Y being in the positive outlet. So in that case, we can turn, we can transform the, we have again the, the adversarial problem. So the primal adversarial problem and it's dual here which are roughly the same form as before. And yeah, few few observations on that. Um, so the, if you fix X and V, the dual adversarial problem here is uh, a linear problem, completely linear. And the feasible region is independent of X and V themselves. So it only depends on the problem data. So first observation. Second observation is uh, the dual adversarial problem has to be feasible, otherwise you don't have a uh, near optimal robustness. And lastly, the dual adversarial problem has to be bounded because uh, if it's not bounded, it means the primal will be uh, infeasible. And if the primal adversarial is infeasible, it means the lower level problem in the bi-level initial problem will be also infeasible. And this, this would mean your problem is infeasible in the first place. So we have this problem, which is uh, which has to be uh, bounded, which has to be feasible, and we know uh, in advance the, um, the feasible set. And the feasible set here is a polytope, and we're optimizing a linear function. So this means the um, uh, the, the 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 optimum solution will fall on one of the extreme vertices of this dual polyhedron, and that's a. Uh, uh, big improvement compared to the convex case because here it means we can compute in advance the vertices of this dual polyhedron and uh, use that in a, in a solution. So instead of having this bilinear expression here that, that is non-convex, non-linear that we need to tackle directly, um, we can replace it with uh, the extreme vertices of this dual polyhedron. And so this means replacing the bilinear term by a disjunction, basically. And the disjunction is specifying the uh, one of these dual extreme vertices has to be feasible for my dual near optimal constraints. And so the, the global resulting model, instead of being a non-convex MI NLP, is becoming a MILP. So we are fully linearizing all, all of the constraints instead of 
keeping these non-convex constraints that we don't solve very efficiently in general. And so, yeah, the, the resulting model is at the end completely linear and just adds some, some integrality conditions. Uh, so the, the good thing is we can tackle MILP fairly, fairly well these days uh, with the current technology. And also we, well, if we can prove infeasibility very fast if we, on some parts of the problems. Um, Matthew, I just want to say um, you're at a five minute mark. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, I finish on, on an example here uh, to grasp some intuition of it. So if we get back to the, to the, to the initial example of the bilevel problem like this, we wonder what will the optimality constraints look like in that case. Uh, so that's the problem data. And so we can compute the alpha beta feasible space for, for these constraints. And this results in one extreme vertex and four extreme rays, which we discard because we, um, we just consider the extreme vertices in that case. And this vertex uh, results in, uh, so a disjunction of a one constraint, so which means we need this constraint to be, to be valid. And this results in uh, these two linear constraints in that case. And so if we look back at the problem and add these constraints, this looks like that. So basically, these, uh, the two constraints are cutting the exterior part of my extreme polytope and it's shrinking more if I increase the, the value of a tolerance. So meaning if as an upper level, I consider I am more and more conservative on the behavior of my lower level, my problem will be harder to solve because I'm cutting a larger part of my feasible set. And if I push my delta value, meaning I'm more and more conservative on, on what's going on on the lower level, I'm shrinking my feasible set down to a single point in the end. Right, uh, I'm gonna stop here to take questions, uh, jump directly to the conclusion. And yeah, that would be it for me. Um, in, yeah, big, big lines is, so near optimality is a great way to make um, bi-level problems more robust and, to, and have a nice interpretability in terms of fluctuations or non-rationality of, of the follower of a game. And yeah, that would be it for me, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Matthew. Um, and if you have a question for the speaker, please uh, put your name in the queue or just uh, pipe in um, with the mic. Um, so Matthew, I like your um, the last bullet on your slide. Yep. Um, that's a that's a good objective. <laughs> Um, so um, if we go back to to the to the like, example that you showed us in the yep. beginning with the pricing for the airlines, yep. um, did you actually uh, do an application on on such a problem with your uh, with your model, or is this just to give us an overview? Yeah, so this one was mostly for, for an overview. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the particularity here would be that um, for pricing problems like this, you have a discrete choice of, uh, of the customer because the customer will just pick one, one ticket, for example. Right. And uh, the, the special thing for that is that you end up with a lower level, which is a, let's say, a mixed integer or integer problem. It's discrete choices. And right. Then, and because of this, you would not be able to use the classical duality tools to model the both uh, mm -hmm. the customer choice, the optimality choice of the customer, but mm -hmm. also the the near optimality robustness constraints, because both of the tools will use duality for this. So this mm -hmm. this will need uh, more, let's say, mixed integer bilevel tools, stuff like that. Right. And or some yeah. sort of transformation. Yeah. To exactly. Go from the mix. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, it seems to me that though in this problem, perhaps the behavior of the followers can be somewhat um, more tr is more transparent than in other problems. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you have the run of the mill consumer who will do what's best for them <laughs> and yeah. probably what's worse for you <laughs> in terms of they'll try to get to the, to the cheapest ticket. And then you have another much smaller class of consumers who have different constraints, right? So it's yeah. a, it seems like an interesting uh, problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the big thing for this is, so from the upper level perspective for, for this example would be your constraints are not just, so the, 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 the total revenue you have would be an objective. 
Mm -hmm. so then your constraints might matter a lot more than the objective. So for example, not overbooking your flights or not right. getting any empty flights mm -hmm. and, and man, trying to maintain these, uh, these constraints, even if the customers deviate a bit from their objective might be interesting right. to see. Yeah. Thank you so much.